Hello and welcome to the webinar, Qualitative Data Collection for the Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health, also known as CURCA. My name is Jamie Jensen and I am a Senior Research Associate in the Center for Health Outcomes and Population Research. Because the lab I work in often utilizes qualitative data, I've been asked by the CURCA Methodology Corps to lead you through an explanation and the purpose of qualitative data. We'll also discuss why qualitative research is important and provide information on how to collect and analyze qualitative data. To begin, we ask, why is qualitative research important? Well, qualitative data looks at the how and why of human decision making and captures the points of view of other people without predetermining those points of view. It looks at phenomena in their natural setting. Qualitative findings are also longer, more detailed, and variable in content which can make analysis a bit difficult because responses are neither systematic nor standardized. Open-ended responses permit one to understand the world as seen by the respondents. Another advantage is that qualitative data can be used in various ways depending on the discipline or research purpose. We'll describe some of the different ways later in the presentation. So what is qualitative data? Like I previously mentioned, qualitative data is used to understand an informant's perspective on various topics. This data deals with descriptions since it cannot be described meaningfully in terms of numbers. Examples being hair color, demeanor, even the appearance of cars in the parking lot. When you think qualitative, think quality. Next, how do you collect qualitative data? Well, qualitative findings grow out of three kinds of data, in-depth open-ended interviews, direct observation, and written documents. This brings us back to the different ways that qualitative research can be used depending on your discipline. In-depth interviews can be used, such as a structured or unstructured format. This will be explained further on the next slide, and the uses of key informant interviews or focus groups. Interviews will yield direct quotations from people about their experiences, opinions, feelings, and knowledge. One could also utilize direct observations to gather data consisting of detailed descriptions of people's activities, behaviors, actions, and the full range of interpersonal interactions that are part of an observable human experience. Examples being field research, videos and photography, as well as looking at artifacts. The final way to collect qualitative data is to look at written documentation, such as studying excerpts, open-ended written responses to questionnaires and surveys, quotations, and journal entries. The data for qualitative analysis typically comes from fieldwork, where the researcher makes first-hand observations of activities and interactions. However, for our research purposes, more often than not, we find that we retrieve more qualitative data through interviews and written documents. Let's look closer at in-depth interviews. Interviews can be one-on-one, -on -one, often referred to as a key informant interview, or in a group setting. Key informants are typically professionals or insiders with special knowledge or status who are willing to share what they know with the researcher. The key informant partnership often includes a degree of collegiality, not typical of most data collection. Interviews can also be unstructured, allowing the discussion to cover a variety of topics based on where the responses may lead. Semi-structured, often referred to as a focus group. Uh, the questions are op uh, often open-ended in nature, but there are questions to help guide the discussion. Lastly, interviews may be structured uh, where the interviewer asks the same questions in the same way for each interviewee. With this format, questions might be phrased in an order that limits the range of responses. It is also good to note that skillful interviewing involves much more than just asking questions. Speak clearly but casually, avoiding any suggestion that one answer might be more desirable than another. Inexperienced interviewers often use words that inter inadvertently suggest answers. Remember that qualitative questions are informal, non-judgmental, and open. 
Okay, looking closer at focus groups. A focus group is the use of group interaction to produce data and insights that would be less accessible without the interaction found in a group setting. Focus groups depend as much on the exchange of ideas among participants as they do on answers to specific questions from the interviewer. Typically, a focus group is on the smaller side, around four to eight people, and the open discussion is led by the interviewer, also known as a moderator. The aim of a focus group is to make use of participants' feelings, perceptions, and opinions. It also wouldn't hurt to attend a training on how to conduct a focus group before planning to lead a focus group. What is great about a focus group is that the discussion allows the moderator to explore a topic that is difficult to observe, such as the topic of drinking while pregnant. Focus groups may also be used to gather preliminary data for future research and can act as a needs assessment for a particular community. What better way to find out a community's needs than by asking members of that very community? Focus groups can also aid in the development of a survey and further research, as well as clarifying research findings from another method that has been used, such as the key informant interview. Analyzing qualitative data begins by interpreting the data. The challenge of qualitative analysis lies in making sense of massive amounts of data. In short, no absolute rules exist, except perhaps to just do your very best with your full knowledge to fairly represent the data and communicate what is revealed in the data given the purpose of the study. So coding data, developing a classification or coding scheme is the first step of analysis. Codes are typically words for identifying themes or primary patterns in the data. Coding entails figuring out possible categories, patterns, and themes that took place with the interviews and focus group discussions. Once codes have been finalized, they are organized within a codebook, which is used to interpret the data. Many codes are created by utilizing the survey questions as major themes, and oftentimes there will be sub-themes within the major theme. A codebook often includes a definition and, de and description of each code or theme. Inclusion and exclusion criteria are also available, as well as examples of real text for each theme and examples of the theme's boundaries if it is an abstract code. In explaining the coding process, I'll describe it as done traditionally, which is without software, to highlight the thinking and mechanics involved. There are software programs that provide different tools and formats for coding, but the principles of the analytical process are the same whether you're doing it manually or with the assistance of a computer program. First, I begin by reading through all the field notes and the verbatim transcripts from interviews and focus groups and make comments in the margins that contain my notations about what I can do with the different parts of the data, as well as different comments that may stand out. This constitutes the first cut at organizing the data into topics and files. Coming up with topics is like constructing an index for a book or labels for a file system. You look at what is there and give it a name or a label. They copy which topics and labels are written, and this becomes the index copy or field notes for the interviews. Many passages will illustrate more than one theme or pattern. The first reading through of the data is aimed at developing the coding categories or classification system. Then a new reading is done to actually start the formal coding in a systematic way. Several readings of the data may be necessary before field notes or interviews can be completely indexed or coded. Some people find it helpful to use colored highlighters to color code uh, your different ideas or concepts that you're finding. Figure out what things fit together by looking for reoccurring regularities in the data. These regularities reveal patterns that can be sorted into categories. It is also helpful to have more than one person working on the analysis. Perhaps even create a small team. Have each person read through and develop their own coding scheme independently, then meet to compare and discuss similarities and differences. Once everyone from the team comes to agreement 
often an elaborate classification system will have emerged and that will wrap up your analyzing of your qualitative data. That concludes our training on qualitative data collection. If you have questions regarding this training, please email us at info at kirka.org. Also, please check out some of the other training modules available on our website at www.kirka.org. Thank you.